Hello, and welcome to Transportation Chain, a series focused on how current events are impacting transportation, tracking, and supply chain management. My name is Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive, and I'll be your host for this episode. Our series opens with a look at the current state of freight and transportation, including economic data on the availability of vehicles and supply of and movement of materials and goods across the United States. We'll also hear from Sarah Jensen, editor of OEM Off Highway, and Kurt Benick, senior field editor of Equipment Today, to discuss the state of manufacturing and how increased federal investment could bolster the production and distribution of vehicles, equipment, parts, and components. The episode will wrap up with Becky Schultz, editor of Equipment Today, who will provide an overview of how a large federal infrastructure package will impact the U.S. economy. But first up is Brielle Jekyll, Associate Editor of Food and Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive, who will share insights on how truckload freight volumes have plummeted and what this means for the freight and transportation industry. Let's check in with Brielle now. Hello, my name is Brielle Jekyll, Associate Editor for Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. And today I'll be providing an economic report outlining the current state of the freight and transportation industry. When the coronavirus hit the United States earlier this year, it turned supply chains across the country upside down. Consumers began panic buying everything from frozen pizzas and canned goods to toilet paper and hand sanitizer. This buying behavior then led to a massive need for trucks to help restock stores, further compounding the issue of labor shortage, which existed prior to the coronavirus. But it's the rising cost, shrinking capacity, and panic customers that are shaking up the freight, transportation, and logistics markets, according to a report released by ABI Research. The ABI Research study reveals rail freight to be down by approximately 50%, and global air cargo volumes for the last month are expected to be down 9%. 49% of respondents from a DHL survey said that the coronavirus had resulted in them taking a more conservative approach to their business's global trade strategy. What is more is new data insights from Geotab highlight the impact COVID-19 has had on commercial vehicle activity in seven major U.S. cities. According to the analysis, the U.S. city with the largest increase in average road speeds was New York City, moving from an average speed of 17 and a half miles per hour to an average of 21 miles per hour, a 20% increase. San Francisco and Washington, D.C. had the second largest increase in average road speeds. The analysis also examined the average time stopped at city intersections after March 15th compared to average times from February 22nd to March 15th. The city with the largest reduction in time spent at intersections was Atlanta at 17%, with an average of 35 seconds spent at an intersection compared to 42 seconds before March 15th. The city that showed the smallest reduction in time spent at intersections is Seattle, with a 3% difference since March 15th. Yet goods are still moving from point A to point B, and much of that is a direct result of how the transportation network is set up and how quickly companies implement technology to keep employees, products, and facilities safe. According to DAT Solutions, truckload freight volumes plummeted in April and appeared to bottom out with much of the economy still shut down. So when we look at the spot market for transportation, it is very heavily um, driven by short-term supply and demand. So the contract market, which is a much larger piece of the transportation market, moves a lot more slowly, um, and there's a lot of more macro uh, push there. What we see in the spot market is it's very sensitive to what's happening right now. And just as we saw March shoot up due to restocking of essential goods at grocery stores, um, and then April collapsed back down with social distancing, as states have started to reopen, as produce harvest has started to happen in the South um, and coming across the border from Mexico, we started to see those that increased demand uh, for shipping Uh, drive rates upward. Um, And this is a trend that's been going on for a couple of weeks now. So, you know, on the reefer side, we've seen a more pronounced upward trend. And on the drive van side, we've seen more of a kind of a bounce off the bottom, if you will. Likewise, according to ACT Research's latest North American commercial vehicle outlook, 2021 is forecast as a transition year. 
Global economies and North American commercial vehicle demand will move from COVID-19's negative impacts to a more meaningful situation in 2022. Massive economic pressure will weigh on freight volumes for a long time. Excess capacity is still material and the midterm outlook remains very uncertain. On a seasonally adjusted basis, container imports fell 20% in the two months from January to March, and similar declines on a year-over-year basis will likely be with us at least into summer. This is from Tim Denoyer, Vice President and Senior Analyst for ACT Research. Truck market volumes have come off the bottom but aren't anywhere considered normal according to a webinar hosted by FTR Transportation Intelligence. And as states begin to open up and businesses return to regular scheduled programs, truck freight recovery period will enter the restart phase. So I think the one thing that we speak a lot about and we feel adamantly about is the the need sort of for up and down chain transparency in the way that how that can benefit all players, whether you're a shipper, a broker, a carrier, um, sort of even a, a vested interest industry observer. The sense that transactions are happening faster, the handshake between a shipper and a carrier or a broker, we see it on our own load board is happening quicker, more digitally, less interpersonal. So arming yourself with the information, um, understanding how the market works and not necessarily how to use it to your advantage, but to make sure that things aren't happening to you as much as you're controlling how you, re- you know, the way that you respond to them. We're seeing those are the players that are coming out with far more success than folks just passively letting, letting the market happen to them. The virus is now impacting the global supply chain with a current estimate of 113 countries identified as reporting cases, according to ABI research. Both capacity and pricing swings are anticipated across transportation modes with the associated impact to shippers worldwide. But this up and down change could benefit the future of the freight transportation industry. This concludes our economic report outlining the current state of the freight and transportation industry. I'm Brielle Jekyll, Associate Editor for Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brielle. In our next segment, Sarah Jensen, editor of OEM Off Highway, and Kurt Bennett, senior field editor of Equipment Today, discuss the state of manufacturing in relation to increased federal investment. Hi, this is Kurt Bennett. I'm with 4constructionpros.com. I'm here with Sarah Jensen with OEM Off Highway, and we're here to talk about what's going on, the COVID impact on the manufacturers and the dealers in the industry and what it looks like today and going forward as we're trying to get back to actually producing vehicles again. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Kurt. How's it going? Pretty good. Truck manufacturing ground to a halt in the middle of March as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold. Plant shut down and to protect workers, many vocational truck users deemed essential businesses witnessed significant slowdowns while others had to temporarily suspend operations. This contributed to a plunge in Class 8 truck orders to their lowest level in the modern era. Matter of fact, FTR reported that order activity was 44% below March and 73% less than a year ago. Unbelievably, only 4,000 Class 8 trucks were sold in March, bringing the yearly total to just 160,000 units. But now, we're actually turning a corner. The end of April saw many of the Class 8 manufacturers start to come back online. However, it is not easy to simply to bring plants up to full production, and customers will remain cautious about placing new orders. It's been much the same in the heavy equipment space. A lot of OEMs and suppliers had to temporarily shut down or reduce shifts and uh, because of the safety concerns and just equipment demand really Uh, went down in the first quarter. Many of them are are starting to uh, reopen their facilities and ramp up production, although equipment demand is still expected to be low for the next several quarters, possibly won't pick up again until 
2021. But as manufacturers are starting to reopen, they're putting a lot of new safety practices in place to help protect the health of their workers and prevent any further spread of the coronavirus. Recently, uh, ABC's Nightline interviewed both AEM's President Dennis Slater and employees at Cummins Seymour, Indiana facility about these new procedures, how that's going for manufacturers, and sort of what are some ways the industry is adapting and will continue to adapt uh, going forward. The Cummins engine plant reopening last week after shutting its doors amidst the crush of COVID-19. Eager employees returning to find a slate of new safety protocols. I'm not someone who can just sit around the house, so I was ready to come back. <laughs> Are you experiencing one or more of the following symptoms? We're asked a series of questions to make sure that we're not feeling ill. Then we got our temperature checked. You're good, thank you. Thanks. We're given a mask for today. Thank you. Then you're ready to go to work, build some engines. <laughs> it's getting through the uncertainty part of it. Manufacturing in any business hates uncertainty. Dennis Slater represents equipment manufacturers nationwide. How do they plan for what's next? How do they know how many machines to build, how many employees to have? So I think what you'll see there is they will start to react to how can they make not only their work sites safer, but then maybe make their machines more efficient. We've been lucky enough to speak to some companies that have been able to adapt, but there are a number of companies that are not going to survive this. And I'm wondering, do you see a silver lining? I think the silver lining is some of the things we're doing today will help us as we go forward that we wouldn't have done if the economy just stayed going strong. It is going to force us again to look at how we make our machines, the technology, more productive, more efficient. Thanks, Sarah. And I, I know manufacturers have developed plans to protect workers, including health checks, before entering the plant. Reconfiguring the production line to allow social distancing, which recommendations are about six foot spacing, where possible. And installing protective barriers where this is not possible. Workers are needing to be retrained in safe procedures to prevent possible spread of COVID-19. And breaks and shifts are being staggered to minimize congestion as employees move around the plants. Depending upon the size and complexity of operations, it's going to take a while for the plants to get working efficiently. Ford and Ram Trucks, manufacturers of medium-duty and heavy-duty commercial trucks, recently shared their detailed plans for restarting their, commercial, their plants. We have worked closely with the unions to establish protocols that will ensure employees feel safe at work and every step possible has been taken to protect them, says Mike Manley, the CEO of FCA. Reconfiguring the plants is a major challenge. In the case of FCA, Ram Trucks' parent, this meant 17,000 workstations had to be analyzed and evaluated to meet social distancing recommendations. And more than 4,700 job areas and workstations were redesigned or protective barriers were installed. So it's quite an extensive task. Similarly, Ford introduced detailed standards and precautions that will be used in reopening its plants. We've been working intently on how to restart our operations and safely bring our employees, and we're ready, says Jim Farley, Ford's chief operating officer. He adds, we have gone through and trialed these processes. Production of F-Series trucks requires four production plants, approximately 19,000 employees, and 2,000 U.S. suppliers. To get these plants up and running, a handful of workers were brought back to install safety equipment and put new safety protocols in place. The company has been developing a plan to safely reopen since it closed to protect workers from the spread of COVID-19. A comprehensive playbook with procedures and protocols detail how the Ford team will work together to keep everyone safe and healthy. Um, and I don't know what you've been hearing so far in the industry, Kurt, but um, I know one obstacle that's been mentioned is just get the supply of PPE and sanitizing products. It's already been difficult for many companies um, throughout this coronavirus pandemic and now with more companies starting to implement new safety procedures and starting to ramp up production it could be a challenge we've heard for some companies i know many manufacturers have also shifted their manufacturing over to producing ppe and donating it um, and many of those manufacturers are now producing it for their own employees 
um, such as Mercedes Benz over in Europe. It's tailoring department that makes a lot of the interior decorations for vehicles, has been making face masks for use at Daimler facilities throughout Europe. Um, and then AEM recently announced it's partnering with the Merrick Group to provide manufacturers with a source to uh, procure PPE sanitizing products as well as display graphics because many manufacturers are now having to put up new signage to remind people of the new safety protocols and keeping a safe distance of six feet or more um, between workers. So it'll be interesting to kind of see how that will continue and um, going forward. Yeah, Sarah, in addition to the manufacturing efforts on the plant side, a lot of the manufacturers are also focused on trying to make the dealership experience safe. And they're helping the dealers position themselves for, for reopening. Some of the manufacturers are all working with their dealer networks to ensure the dealer and customer safety during the pandemic. Volvo and Mack trucks are using certified uptime process to promote safety and social distancing. These companies implemented the certified uptime process in 2016, initially to help dealers build best practices to increase repair efficiencies and enhance the overall customer experience. Central to this process is the assist communication platform that enables remote communications and automates the documentation for service event, keeping all information in one place and minimizing in-person contact with the customer. This allows repair services to be completed with minimum internal interaction at the dealership. One of the dealers, Vision Truck Center in Ontario, Canada, is a Mac and Volvo certified uptime dealer that has just instituted a policy requiring a 100% paperless process. All service jobs are handled through the Assist platform with no paper routing. The Assist platform has made it possible to have a paperless process in order to minimize human contact. Our entire staff has remained focused on certified uptime process while we make sure we don't compromise the safety of our customers or employees, says John Slotgroff, owner and dealer principal of Vision Truck Center. No paper is passed throughout the site. Team members communicate via assist, allowing technicians to receive and view work assignments on their iPads, while also allowing fleet managers to complete visibility into the work being completed. Another dealer, Affinity Truck Center, with two certified uptime locations in California's Central Valley region, created a process for quick, accurate service check-ins. As trucks enter, they trigger a bell in the service office. A technician thoroughly disinfects each truck before it is driven through the gate. Each new write-up is handled through a secure, tented entryway, equipped with a sensor that alerts the service staff when the customer enters. Specifically, installed plexiglass barriers separate the customer and the service advisory during check-in. Now that the weather is heating up, Chris Paris, the service manager at Affinity Truck Center, says they are actively looking into additional ways to keep customers safe and enable them to practice social distancing in a comfortable indoor environment. Along with custom plexiglass shields and floor markers in both parts of sales facilities, the dealership is in the process of opening a larger customer waiting room with dedicated restrooms. Canal Didi, Volvo Trucks North America Director of Customer Product Productivity Solutions says, we are seeing certified uptime dealers across the U.S. and Canada going the extra mile to maintain standards of excellence while ensuring human safety throughout the service process. So as you can see, both manufacturers and dealers are taking steps to reopen and try to get back to a normal operating procedure. It'll be interesting to see how they can, it all continues to proceed and if there are any further technological advances that come from it or other new safety protocols that they put in place. Thank you, Sarah and Kurt. In our final segment, Becky Schultz, Editor of Equipment Today, provides an overview on federal infrastructure packages and their impact on the U.S. economy. Becky?
major infrastructure investment plan has been kicked around on Capitol Hill since the very early days of the Trump administration. Yet it continues to be blocked in Congress despite stated bipartisan support. The proposal has come up yet again, but this time as a means to promote economic recovery in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. So how can a major infrastructure investment facilitate economic recovery? Before exploring this, I'd like to explore the toll taken by underinvestment, particularly in the nation's highways, roads, and bridges. The American Society of Civil Engineers reports that more than 25% of bridges in the U.S. either need significant repairs or are handling more traffic than they were originally designed to carry. In addition, 32% or more than one-third of America's major urban roads are in poor or mediocre condition. This is estimated to cost U.S. motorists traveling on deficient pavement $67 billion a year. In addition, an analysis by the American Road and Transportation Builders Association indicates nearly 231,000 U.S. bridges need major repair work or should be replaced. That represents 30 percent, again, more than a third of all U.S. bridges. Congestion represents another significant cost factor. According to the 2019 Urban Mobility Report published by the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, over the past 10 years, the total cost of delays in the top U.S. urban areas has grown by nearly 50%. In 2017, congestion caused motorists in these areas to travel an extra 8.8 billion hours and purchase an extra 3.3 billion gallons of fuel for a total congestion cost of $166 billion. Trucks accounted for $20 billion, or 11% of the cost, despite making up only 7% of traffic. The impact on the movement of people, goods, and materials continues to mount. I spoke with Brian Termel, Vice President, Public Affairs and Strategic Initiatives with the Associated General Contractors of America, specifically on this topic. One of the, the great innovations of the American economy over the last 30, 40 years, and you've heard a lot about this, is that we've essentially created a just-in-time model for business. So that if I'm the gap, right, the shirts that I expect to sell on Tuesday arrive at my store on Monday evening. If I'm Harley Davidson and my assembly factory in, uh, I think it's in Wauwatosa, uh, is expecting uh, the engines to arrive from my plant in Kansas City minutes before I need to drop them into the chassis of the bike, right? And that means that our economy is far more efficient. We don't have to spend money on warehousing items. We don't stockpile items like a cold sort of dark warehouse until they're needed. We're hyper-efficient. But, but that just-in-time model for our economy really works well when our transportation network is in good shape. It doesn't work well if those engines are stuck because they got to be rerouted around a bridge that's been posted for lighter traffic somewhere between the city and suburban Milwaukee. Uh, and it doesn't work if the, the fresh fruit that's on its way to my neighborhood Safeway is stuck in traffic somewhere in Berlin, Maryland, right? Because someone hit a pothole and careened out of their lane and hit someone else. So our infrastructure, which kind of allowed us to become a hyper-efficient economy, uh, as it deteriorates, is undermining the very innovations that, that it once encouraged. And that slows down our ability to be as competitive, and that certainly raises prices for materials. In the construction industry, we see that uh, if you think about most construction projects, there's no warehouse, right? Your warehouse is the 10 feet between the construction fence and the front of the building. So construction is particularly sensitive to, to on-time delivery because if you've got a bunch of glazers scheduled to show up on Thursday to install all your windows, but your windows are stuck in Kenosha when they're supposed to be in Sheboygan, then that's going to be a problem. Uh, right a bunch of glaciers to stand around and do nothing but drink coffee, hopefully at a socially distanced and masked, you know, <laughs> but nonetheless, that's why uh, both because we've got members who build roads and bridges, but also because all of our members depend on the infrastructure. Uh, our association is, is long advocated and is you know, ramped up its advocacy 
for investing more in our roads and bridges and other forms of public infrastructure. So what type of investment might it take to bring the transportation system up to par? The U.S. Department of Transportation estimates it could cost as much as $1 trillion just to bring the current interstate and highway system in the U.S. up to date. The American Society of Civil Engineers, in its latest report for America's infrastructure, stated the estimated investment needed by 2025 is $4.59 trillion, of which $2 trillion is unfunded. The Trump administration has again floated a $2 trillion invest infrastructure investment plan, but there seems to be little stomach for it in Congress. Yet, according to Norm Anderson, President and CEO CGLA Infrastructure, return on investment on that $2 trillion or more is substantial. Do that. So any infrastructure initiative has to be really smart in terms of the building blocks for our next economy, and, and it has to be sustainable. That's why we think it has to be even larger than President Trump calls for. He calls for a $2 trillion initiative. We actually think it needs to be about $300 billion for 10 years. So that would be $3 trillion. Every billion dollars invested in infrastructure, according to our calculation, yields about 1,200 direct jobs, and maybe another 3,000 indirect jobs. So let's say 4,000 jobs. So if we were to do $300 billion times four is a million two in terms of new, uh, new jobs. Uh, that would get us moving in the, in the right direction in terms of uh, bringing the country back as quickly as possible. Getting such a large bill through Congress will be no easy task. Mike Bellaman, president and CEO, Associated Builders and Contractors, believes that in order for it to be even considered, it must go beyond what we traditionally view as infrastructure. Is when you think about infrastructure now, you know, we traditionally think about, you know, roads and mass transit and stuff, but, uh, you know, I, I think we need to be looking at, we are uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, an infrastructure plan that would uh, address uh, issues related to this. So rural broadband connectivity, cybersecurity, national security type manufacturing and supply chains. Uh, you know, we've been talking about, you know, uh, fixing our infrastructure around airports. Well, you know, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to handle, uh, you know, this virus going forward in, in, in airports and screening and things, but that consideration, uh, schools, uh, in universities, you know, how are we going to handle those types of uh, situations? But pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, research, redundancy around that, uh, and and being able to produce, you know, P PPE and, and things that we need to be able to be self-dependent upon. So CGLA's Norm Anderson also believes a challenge in moving a plan forward is the perception in Congress of what infrastructure entails. If you and I walked up to Capitol Hill and we talked to a hundred congressmen, I guarantee you everybody would have a different definition of infrastructure. Some would put energy, electricity in, some wouldn't. Some would put oil and gas in, some wouldn't. Most wouldn't put water and wastewater in. You have to put that in. I think you need to put social infrastructure, so hospitals, clinics, schools, all that to me is infrastructure, and then okay. all the stuff that ties it together on the logistics side. All that is infrastructure, and nobody's, we're not even having that conversation. The other point that's really interesting is because of what's happened with the coronavirus in China, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to um, reinforce our supply chain here for everything, uh, including medical equipment, PPP, et cetera, but also for everything else, because you can't be, be reliant on one country for all the stuff that makes you successful and powerful. Um, sure. That's gonna create a huge amount of additional um, opportunity for the infrastructure industry, but the, in, in, the industry needs to start speaking as an industry, not as uh, a balkanized set of um, uh, businesses. Changing mindsets in D.C. won't be easy, particularly in the current political climate. AGC's Brian Termale and I spoke about what the reality of infrastructure investment might be 
given the current environment in Washington? I mean, you, you know, I think there have been a lot of reports that Republicans, particularly in the Senate, are hesitant to write another large check until they see how, what kind of recovery we're going to have when more states end their lockdowns, right? These, when these economic lockdowns come to an end, are we going to see that sort of V-shaped recovery, or is it going to be more like the Nike swoosh where it's a quick drop and then a very slow rise? If it's a quick drop and a very slow rise, there's a good chance that that even Republicans in the Senate will realize we need to do more, and certainly investing in infrastructure or something that's a lot easier for Republicans and Democrats to agree on than on you know some form of the Green New Deal or or other measures like that. So there's a chance, but to some extent we feel a little bit like Charlie Brown with the football uh, that Lucy always holds out, you know, and pulls away at the last minute. Politicians are always talking about infrastructure. And they're not going to, and we end up not seeing it in in that sort of big package. But you know, let's say worst case scenario, we don't get a huge infrastructure package as part of coronavirus coronavirus relief measure 4.0, or I think that's the next one. Uh, even if we don't get a big bill with a capital B, we're likely to get decent sized bills, the lowercase b, in that Congress still has to authorize a new surface transportation bill. They still have to authorize a new Water Resources Development Act. They still have to authorize the the Federal Aviation Administration uh, capital accounts. So even if there's not a huge headline making sort of, you know, large figure infrastructure bill that comes out as part of a single package, uh, we have every reason to expect that Congress will find ways to plus up the amount of money that they're putting into infrastructure with all these smaller bills. Because as much as Republicans, I think, are wary of you know, getting tagged with spending even more in the trillions, they also appreciate the economic benefits of infrastructure, and they may just find ways to do it a little bit more on the down low than with a single, single sort of blockbuster bill. So, you know, we're, we're not letting our guard up. We're certainly doing everything we can to educate Congress. But uh, you know, if, I had to, if I had to bet, I'd say we're more likely to get good, good decent-sized bills then we are to get a single large infrastructure bill out of the recovery effort. Clearly, the economic benefits of inf- investing in infrastructure right now are, are much better than they were even a year ago in the sense that construction firms have the ability to easily and quickly ramp up staffing, right? If we put $2 trillion in infrastructure last year, contractors would have found a way to make it work. It would have struggled to add much more to their size of their because we were in the tightest labor market anyone had ever seen. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, mostly unfortunately, we've now got 30 plus million people in the labor force. So the economic benefits of the, the making that $2 trillion in infrastructure investment now would be enormous because construction firms would be able to bring in a lot of people out of the unemployment roles and put them to work in high paying construction careers. So that would be you know, an immediate benefit uh, beyond the sort of the broader multiplier impact of construction firms buying more equipment, more materials, more supplies, more vests, more helmets, all that, most of which is made in the United States. You know, the broader impact is uh, obviously in making our economy more efficient, right? And and who knows what the longer term trends are going to be in terms of how business operates post coronavirus. But one thing is likely is that we're going to see a lot more regional concentration of manufacturing. I think, you know, this, the coronavirus has been a real eye opener for folks that, you know, it's, it's a little bit naive to rely on everything you need as essential for this country to come from overseas, especially a country may, that may not have our interests in mind. So you're going to see, uh, we think, an acceleration of the sort of insourcing of more manufacturing capacity in the United States, which means that we got to have our, our surface transportation network uh, improve so that we can better move goods from the southeast to the southwest as opposed to about of worrying about how to just move goods from the Port of LA, Long Beach to the Mall of America. No matter what form the investment may take, it has clear benefits to construction, transportation, and the supply chain. Communication with congressional legislators will be key to moving it forward. They need to hear from leaders within your industry segments as to the importance of infrastructure investment to the future of your business 
as well as to the overall U.S. economic recovery. Thank you, Becky. That's it for this episode of Transportation Chain. Thank you for watching, and be sure to tune in to our next episode as we take an even deeper look into transportation, trucking, and supply chain management. Until next time.